I'm here now with Laura from Sutton Hoo, which makes you sound very old and very grand. You're not actually an Anglo-Saxon. Um, what is your job at Sutton Hoo? Yep, um, so I'm the Archaeology and Engagement Manager at National Trust Sutton Hoo. Nice. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, so just like a bit of what is what is Sutton Hoo? <laughs> yep. Um, so Sutton Hoo, um, we refer to as... Um, it's kind of one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. Now that's that's a pretty bold statement to make, but it does it does live up to the reputation. So it's an Anglo-Saxon burial site, so uh, a royal burial ground, and um, just to kind of locate people. So we're on the kind of the River Deben across from Woodbridge in Suffolk. Um, so it's a seventh century Anglo-Saxon royal burial site, um, and then there's kind of lots of different. Um, phases to Sutton Hoo's history, you know, landscapes are layered, um, but principally what people will know if they know anything about Sutton Hoo will be uh, a discovery that was made in 1939 um, that kind of truly revolutionised our understanding of who these people were, uh, a period that was seen as the dark ages were suddenly illuminated and from this burial came some remarkable um, objects such as the Sutton Hoo helmet, which is world famous. So, um, yeah, if you know anything about Sutton Hoo, that's probably what you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, it's recently become even more famous through the Netflix movie of The Dig. Um, so how soon was Sutton Hoo sort of told that there was going to be a movie made? Um, I think there's always been... Um... So there's there's a book called The Dig, which the film is um, based on, and it's all inspired by events that happened at Sutton Hoo. So I think important to say it's not kind of a documentary as such, but it's um, inspired by real events and real people. Um, there's yeah, so there's a book um, written by John Preston called The Dig, and I think there's always been kind of conversations or rumours that there was going to be a film uh, for many years now, and um, kind of yeah we weren't really sure you know what was happening with that and thought oh it'll be amazing if it does happen and then um it kind of gathered pace you know quite quickly and um members of the cast and crew came to the site to do their research um and I think get a feeling of kind of the story and the site and its significance there um and then a couple of us um myself included were very fortunate enough to actually be invited to the film set so that was um a very surreal yet amazing opportunity because um what they found in 1939 was the fossil of a ship so we have very acidic soil here in Suffolk which meant that a lot of the organic material in this uh, royal Anglo-Saxon ship burial that they discovered had rotted away over time it created this acid bath so when you look at those amazing photos you're not actually seeing the timber of a ship you're seeing the fossil mm -hmm. and that's something that you can't see when you visit Sutton Hoo today that that no longer exists we have a very nice uh full-scale sculptural representation of the ship but you can't see the ship itself so to actually go to the film set and see what it would have been like in 1939 yeah. was just a very weird yet amazing um opportunity it was like we kind of stumbled into one of the photographs in our collection yeah. um and it kind of walking past people and being like oh, I know who that is by the way that they're dressed a lot <laughs> of the characters um are synonymous with kind of certain bits of their kind of um, kind of costume. So Basil Brown, for example, you know, local um, pride for him, I think, as well as really come out for the film uh, with his flat cap and his pipe and those kind of things. And it was just kind of like, oh yes, that must be so and so, and that must be <laughs> so. Yeah, it was a great opportunity. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Um, so to just d dive straight into the sort of characters of the film, because one thing I asked you to sort of research for me was the difference, because I always find it interesting, and you're absolutely right, this is a fictionalised account of a historical event, essentially. And so, of course, certain artistic liberties will have been taken, but I'd really love to see just how artistic the liberties were, if that makes sense. Yeah, so with the, the film, obviously some creative license has been used and it's based on the book. Um, I mean, I won't go through all the differences, but just to give you a flavour of some of the ways in which the film deviates from kind of the true story. And we are hoping that the film will encourage people to come and visit National Trust Sutton Hoo as and when restrictions are lifted mm -hmm. so people can discover more about the true story. But we have got 
a really interesting article on our website that's digging the dirt so the kind of the true story behind the film so anyone who's watched it and thinks did that really happen was it like that I encourage you to have a look at that but I'll just go through a couple of examples so Rory Lomax who is played by Johnny Flynn in the film um he is a fictional character and he is uh Edith Pretty's cousin I think in the mm -hmm. film um and he kind of takes on board the role of the kind of the site photographer in the film um and in actual fact lots of different people took photographs uh during the excavation Basil took some photographs um other people that came as well um but one uh well two of the photographers that I'd really like to highlight are Mercy Lack and Barbara Wagstaff and they um arrived at Sutton Heath after the treasures had been removed but what they did was help document the fossil of the ship and this is a time that I don't think it's really represented in the film so much, but it's when the Science Museum come and survey the ship after all the treasures have been removed. And that's roughly the time frame when they're on site. And between them, they took about 60% of the contemporary negative record of the dig. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their contribution is huge. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the plans of the ship went up in flames during the blitz. Um, so their photographs, and these are recorded in meticulous detail of the ship, um, they, it's really kind of important, not only from kind of a social history point of view, but the technical kind of archaeological record as well. Um, so they were both school teachers, and saying amateur photographers is, it's always a bit of a difficult word to use. They, they were really kind of uh, knew their stuff. And they both went on to become associates of the Royal Photographic Society. Wow. We think that their, um, the photographs that they took at Sutton who might have formed part of their portfolio for that. Mm -hmm. And um, we're very fortunate enough to have um, a set of their photographs at Sutton Hoo in our archive, which were donated by Mercy Lack's uh, great nephew, Andrew Lack. And we are just going through a project at the moment to conserve and digitise those photographs so they can be more readily shared. But Mercy Lack's albums in particular, I mean, you've got these amazing images in themselves. And then she's gone around either typewritten or handwritten these wonderful notes about who the people are, what ribs of the ship we're looking at, sometimes what time of day it is. Um, and yeah, so that's, I think, one of the differences is that they've kind of, I guess, created a character that serves um in another way but there were these amazing other people um mm -hmm. that were involved in the ship so um I think yeah that's one of the points that um I think the film will hopefully inspire people to discover more about the real people that are involved and the real story as well yeah absolutely that's such a shame that they had the opportunity to put in two more women characters and they instead opted for a young romantic semi-lead instead yeah it's um i mean there's such amazing uh women and um we also have in our collection mercy lack started to write a book about her experiences um and it wasn't published and she she didn't get beyond writing kind of a full draft she got a couple of chapters in but just to hear her own voice about the ghosts of the ship how lucky they were um and yeah, it, it, it's a shame, but I think um, hopefully this kind of project that we've had, this internally funded project to conserve and digitise the photographs, when people can come back to Sutton Who, they can see these photographs uh, displayed. Um, we've got them kind of on a rotating display uh, uh, in our dining room uh, there. So hopefully, yeah, it'll encourage people to discover a bit more about um, the true story, which is such mm -hmm. a rich story in itself. I mean, yeah. there's kind of social history, personal relationships, the backdrop of the beginning of World War II. So I guess, you know, um, in a way it was trying to um, think about, yeah, like with any story and I guess with any film, you can't put it all in. So mm -hmm. I guess it was choosing which bits they wanted to pull out and which bits they could yeah. fit in, I guess. Of course. I would also like to look at Lily James's character because she she was so interesting to me because she was sort of the first one I went and googled straight away and was quite uh, not even surprised just very almost disappointed to find how incredibly experienced and um knowledgeable and good at her field she was compared to the sort of almost ditzy Lily James who's sort of there going oh no I, you know 
I'm so light, I can do some digging. How, do, how does one dig? I, oh, oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, it, um, yeah, so for people that watch, watch the films, it's um, Peggy Piggott, um, and she, well, she was known as Peggy Piggott at the time. Um, she, so this is when she's um, married to Stuart Piggott, who's also one of the archeologists. And I think, yeah, um, she was the only female archeologist involved with the dig, but she was, as you said, very experienced in her own right. Um, and she, she wasn't there because she was married to one of the other archeologists, she was, in her own entity, very well qualified and um, kind of selected in her own right. I mean, she um, so she'd studied at Cambridge and at University College London. By this time, she directed her own dig. She published several academic papers. Uh, her career in the end spanned about 60 years. Um, she um, was recognised for her field methods, her research. She was particularly kind of interested in the prehistoric as well, uh, period, uh, settlements, burial traditions. Um, she became a bit of an expert in glass beads as well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, she, um, later on, I think another thing to say is that her relationship with Stuart, um, they did get divorced uh, many years after the dig, mm -hmm. but remained kind of, um, on good terms, I guess, because from the late 1980s onwards, Peggy was president of the Wiltshire Archaeological and Natural History Society with Stuart as well. Aww. So there was kind of, you know, they did remain in touch and on good terms as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and she um, she had some great experiences um, excavating with uh, Mortimer Wheeler, Aww. who's a bit of a kind of legend, I guess, in the kind of archaeological kind of circles. Um, and she, um, yeah, she she was really amazing. And it's great to see her in the photos of the dig from, from the actual dig that she was there in her boiler suit, you know, and she was just kind of, um, I think she kind of got it. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a practical piece of, you know, she was just kind of one of the group. It wasn't yeah. kind of like she was the the token female archaeologist. She was there because she deserved to be there mm. and the skill that she brought to the excavation. Absolutely. Yeah, rather than her little short shorts and crop tops <laughs> having to borrow <laughs> Carrie Mulligan's trousers. Yeah. Um, I this is quite interesting as well. I I've said this many times about this movie. I I sillily, if that's a word, waited the whole movie for the helmet to sort of be brought out of the ground, as I'm sure many did. And I've seen lots of Facebook and Twitter comments of people being like, well, where was the helmet? So could you explain to us why we didn't see the helmet come out the ground? Yeah. Um, so um, the archaeologist in 1939, so it was, I think it was about a 17 day period. And during that 17 days, they lifted 263 objects. So we're talking <laughs> quite a fast pace when it once it got going. Um, so also, I would like to say, just going back to Peggy, they did get it spot on, though, that she was the one that found the first items of gold. So the, the yes. really lovely sword pyramids. And I was really pleased that that kind of, when I was kind of watching the film, I was like, tick. Yeah, credit where credit's due. And it was also really nice to see that John Jacobs, who was uh, Mrs. Pretty's gardener, he was the one that found the first river. And again, that is reflected in the film. And I think... Um, uh, some of uh, John Jacob's family are still around and we're still in touch with them and I, I really feel for them as well that you know it's that kind of I imagine a real sense of pride as well that you know they're and and I imagine it must feel so strange to see you know your a family member of yours on the kind of the big screen yeah, well. fictionalized yeah. but yeah, yeah credit where credit's due um sorry where were we we were talking about the helmet <laughs> the helmet, that's right, yeah. So over 17 days, 263 objects lifted, so quite fast pace once it got going. Um, and some of the objects, when they came out of kind of, so they spent, you know, roughly 1,300 years buried deep beneath the ground uh, in this undisturbed Anglo-Saxon ship burial. And some of the objects came out like um, 
like they were only buried yesterday. So the, the gold doesn't tarnish. So things like the shoulder clasps, uh, the belt buckle, you know, were just like they were when they were placed in the burial. Wow. But other objects had a bit more of a turbulent history whilst they were buried. So the um, uh, helmet is kind of um, made of kind of iron and copper alloy and other materials. And um, so if you imagine you've kind of got your ship um, and in the middle is kind of like a little kind of chamber with a kind of roof put on it, if you, if you kind of get what I mean, and the earth heaped over that. Now, obviously the weight of the earth over time, water's leaching in as well, caused the burial chamber to collapse. And then some of the objects kind of got crushed, moved. Um, the helmet was one of those objects that just kind of shattered into pieces. Um, and it's hundreds of fragments that make up the helmet and it was kind of the ultimate jigsaw puzzle to put that back together again. So when you um, see photos of the helmet at the British Museum or go and see it when, when you can, um, it's kind of a jute kind of construct, so it's material, and then onto it are adhered the fragments of the helmet, but it's not a complete um, helmet as such. So there's been a lot of years of meticulous research and conservation by our friends at the British Museum mm -hmm. to try and create what they think is the face of the helmet and this is the second time that they've kind of recreated it. The first time I think uh, they did it and it kind of stuck out a little bit, it left the, the neck quite exposed um, so they had another go um, <laughs> as well but yeah so that's why it wasn't a kind of shiny helmet that was lifted <laughs> out it's um, yeah m hundreds of fragments that have been kind of um, reconstructed. Mm, amazing and I'm asking everyone this um, possibly controversial do you think the right decision was made by sending the treasures to the British Museum do you think they should have gone to the Ipswich Museum or do you think that now they should return to Sutton Hoo? Mm, that's a good question. We do get asked that quite a lot as well. Um, I think I'd have to say um, that I think kind of Mrs. Pretty's wishes, so just to kind of give people a bit of backstory, so there was um, a treasure trove inquest uh, in 1939 to determine who was the legal owner of the finds. Was it kind of um, the Crown? Or was it Mrs. Pretty as the landowner and the instigator of the dig? Um, and um, she um, was found to be the legal owner of the gold and silver. Um, that's really what they were looking at uh, in this treasure trove inquest, the gold and silver, but she was the legal owner of all of the treasure. And then in a kind of unparalleled act of generosity um, and a very magnanimous gesture, she donated all of the finds to the nation uh, at the British Museum so that maximum amount of people could see them and enjoy them. And we have a really lovely, um, two lovely letters in our archive um, that after this kind of had happened in this kind of unparalleled act of um, kindness and uh, um, just so magnanimous, you know, that, yeah, it's just amazing. Um, uh, Winston Churchill's office kind of wrote to her from uh, 10 Downing Street to offer her a CBE. And we have that letter. And then we also have the letter that they acknowledge, um, they send back and say, oh, we, we understand, although it's kind of, um, you know, sad about your decision, but we understand that you don't want to accept the CBE. Um, but unfortunately we don't have the letter that she sent to explain <laughs> why, mm -hmm. but we can only hazard a guess that she was, everything that we know about Mrs Pretty and she's actually probably one of the characters that's quite hard to get her voice from 1939 because we don't have kind of for a lot of the other characters we have kind of diary excerpts um interviews they did later on in life mm -hmm. and she's one of the ones that it's always quite hard to kind of pick up her voice so we kind of speculate though given everything we know about her there was a very strong sense of duty that ran throughout her life and she probably felt that she was doing the right thing and she didn't want the kind of the fame, the glory that went with it. She just felt that that was kind of her duty. So, yeah, it was her wish that it went to the British Museum. I think also, so some uh, the finds from the previous year's excavation, which is very, um, which is covered quite quickly in the um, the film. So there were three mounds that were excavated the previous year. The finds from those uh, excavations went to Ipswich Museum. Um, 
I think, yeah, it, it's such a, an amazing archaeological discovery. And I think given the kind of, I guess, the research and conservation required as well, I think, yeah, the British Museum is the kind of, this is pretty decided the home of the treasures. And it's, it's really nice. We work quite closely with the British Museum as well. Um, obviously, the National Trust only um, acquired the site um, back in about 2000, so relatively quite recently. So there wasn't really anything, any provision at, you know, at Mrs. Pretty's time for us to have it on the site, but we work pretty closely with the British Museum and we have had objects back on loan uh, from the British Museum. Uh, we have objects on long-term loan as well from the British Museum from some of the other graves. And I think that gives the opportunity then for local people to see them without having necessarily to go to London. Um, and there's so much kind of digitally as well um, that's been done now in terms of talks and things. So I think given the kind of the research that's come out about Sutton Hill and the kind of um, how big a find it is, I do think, yeah, the British Museum is kind of the rightful kind of home in a way. And that's what Mrs. Yeah. Pretty wanted. And we have to respect her wishes. But it's really nice at the same time to be able to have the opportunities for the objects to come back for local people to see them and the research as well. Um, so yeah, so Sutton Hill is kind of famous the world over as an Anglo-Saxon royal burial site. Um, there are actually two cemeteries at Sutton Hill, which a lot of people don't know about. Um, so there's the kind of the main cemetery, which is kind of seventh century, and it's used for about a roughly a kind of a 50 year period, we think. And, um, there are, it depends who you speak to because one of them was later discounted, but there are 18 burial mounds there. <laughs> um, and within that are, um, so Mound One, the one that everyone thinks of, which is the great ship burial with the helmet, but there are other people there as well. And we think this is kind of a family graveyard in a way, so oh, family wow. cemetery. So each of the burials is slightly different in its own way, like how any funeral is different, you know, it reflects the, the individual buried there. And, part of kind of uh, our job as kind of archaeologists and historians is to kind of tell those people stories and pull out kind of things. So just to give you an example um, or two, so there's um, Mound 2, which is the other ship burial at Sutton Hoo. Um, so there are only three Anglo-Saxon ship burials known of in England, and uh, there's the one at, two, uh, at Snape, nearby at Snape, and then the two at Sutton Hoo. Uh, but that one was heavily kind of robbed, ransacked, and uh, rabbit problems as well. So rivets everywhere. Um, then there's Man 17, and that's the burial of a young uh, warrior and his horse. And we actually have the original objects uh, from that burial on long-term loan to us from the British Museum. So as and when we're open, you can come and see that burial um, in our exhibition hall. And uh, so that's a man kind of sometimes we refer to him as a young warrior but I guess he was actually you know his early 20s so we'll say the warrior and his horse um <laughs> and he was buried alongside his horse um and had all the kind of fittings of a warrior so a sword shield um but some really nice personal touches so um a picnic of lamb chops to take with him on his journey to the next line oh. bridal which is ornate and um very fancy um, and also a he was buried in a tree trunk coffin and at the very last moment a um, a comb seems to have been thrown on top of the coffin because it was standing more or less upright when the archaeologist found it in 1991 um, and we just wonder whether that was somebody at the last moment forgot or it was kind of like I don't know you have to use a bit of Quite creative license. human yeah it's and you have yeah. to use a bit of creative license to bring these people you know to life I guess um but we wonder whether it maybe could have been you know his mum as like a kind of reminder Aww. to keep kind of you know clean and tidy in the next life um there's also the burial a high status burial a female burial which is the only one in the kind of royal cemetery um and we wonder whether that might have been the queen of the as I say we don't exactly know who's buried in which of the mounds but um if we had to kind of um guess I get um we're thinking it's the Woofing dynasty who are the kind of royal dynasty of East Anglia at this time so 
England doesn't actually exist at this point. Uh, it's made up of a series of Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, each ruled by an individual uh, king or ruler. And then much later on, um, that's where we start to see kind of England forming. So it's kind of the emergence of England is happening at this time and power struggles. And um, yeah, the kind of the name that's most often given to the person buried in Mound One, as I say, we, we don't know who he is, but if we had to hazard a guess, um, Radwald is the name that comes up quite a lot and he was um, uh, around at this time and powerful enough to fit the kind of um, th looking at the the grave goods I mean he's the uh, an, somebody who's powerful and important enough to warrant such a burial mm -hmm. um, so it may have potentially been Radwald's queen buried in mound 14 but we can only kind of really speculate and you know um, see what happens there but um yeah at this time so that that's the kind of the royal burial ground in a nutshell and then other things happen later on we've got some execution burials we've got all sorts happening going on there but just sticking to this time period and then um over where our kind of cafe and uh, exhibition buildings are there's a slightly earlier anglo-saxon folk cemetery there which are thought to be the grandparents and parents of the East Anglian kings buried at the burial ground. So there's a, a sequence, a narrative to the kind of the story. And um, Sutton Hu in Old English, which is the, the language of the Anglo-Saxons, means southern settlement and a Hu is a promontory or raised area of land often overlooking water. And the folk cemetery is on one of the Hoos and the royal burial ground is on another of the Hoos. And obviously our proximity to the river, these would have been uh, things that people would have seen quite easily, particularly the burial mounds from the river and remarked, oh, so-and-so is buried there. And there was kind of a, a poetry written into the landscape of who these people were and their kind of stories kind of immortalized in, in the landscape. Mm -hmm.